suicide prevention and intervention. My name is Aaron Gurrell, and I'm the president of the Justice Clearinghouse. This is the second of a series of webinars that will focus on the intersection between the justice system and mental health. On November 13th, we will follow today's webinar up with a discussion about suicide postvention, which will also feature today's presenter, Ms. Amy Morgan. And in December, we will host a presentation from the National Alliance on Mental Illness and Mr. Patton Blau, who will share their unique perspective of the justice system. Please take the time to register for these upcoming webinars at thejusticeclearinghouse.com and keep checking as we're always adding new programming. Amy, if you could go to the next slide. And now just a little bit about the Justice Clearinghouse. The Clearinghouse is a member-supported organization that is funded solely through the contributions of our members. We do not receive grant funding and would ask that each of you consider becoming a member. For only $49 a year, you will have 7x24 access to our library of informative webinars and other materials, while allowing us to continue to provide this kind of information at no cost to our community. And now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter today, Ms. Amy Morgan. Amy is a training officer with the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation. Amy will cover the basics, what signs show possible suicidal thoughts and or risk, how to talk to someone who is considering suicide, how to intervene and seek help, and what to expect when handling an intervention scenario. After participating in this webinar, you will have exposure to the basic first aid skills so that you can possibly save a life from suicide. Next slide, please. The last thing that I would like to address is some basic housekeeping. First, the presentation portion of this webinar is expected to last approximately 45 minutes and will be followed by a 15-minute question and answer session. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to Clearinghouse members within the next couple of days. Second, this is a listen-only event. However, on the right-hand side, you can go to your control panel and type in any questions that you have through the webinar tool. We will address as many questions as possible at the conclusion of this webinar. That said, we do request that you do not include any questions that are involving personal situations. As I'm sure you can understand, Amy is only able to spend a little bit of time with us today and to adequately address any concerns, questions, or personal situations would take much more than just the hour that she has with us. Finally, after today's webinar, we will issue a follow-up survey and we ask that you complete it. Your feedback is important to us and in fact helps us shape our future schedule of events. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to you, Amy. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me on this webinar. I think this is really valuable, practical information, though it is a difficult subject to discuss. And I appreciate your being interested in learning how to prevent or intervene with someone who is thinking of suicide, just in case you counter, encounter it at some point in your lifetime. I use the ASSIST method as my primary intervention method, and that stands for Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. In Oklahoma, this is what is used to train those who work the phone lines for the National Suicide Prevention Talk Line. And I'll give you that number. It's on your screen at the bottom right throughout the presentation. The ASSIST program is a two-day class. And if you're interested in a much more detailed training experience than you're going to get on this one-hour webinar today, I would encourage you to find an ASSIST training in your area. I'll be reviewing with you how to recognize risk factors, what to do when you see them, and how to keep someone safe from completing a suicide. When you register for this webinar, you answered two questions. Of the more than 200 participants attending this webinar today, this is how it breaks down from your answers. To the question, have you ever experienced loss from someone you know due to suicide, 50% of you said yes. To the question, have you ever known someone who talked about suicide, 86% of you said yes. Of the 50% who has experienced loss of an actual suicide, and the 86% of you who said you've heard someone talking about it, 
think about how knowledgeable and prepared you may have or may not have felt about handling that situation. This training today is going to prepare you with that knowledge, much like taking a first aid class. Suicide intervention is really like mental first aid. If someone is having a heart attack, do you want the most skilled heart surgeon in the room, or do you want someone who is trained in CPR? Anyone can be trained in CPR. It's not just for medical professionals. It's the same with suicide intervention. Long-term care comes from professionals, counselors, but the moment of an intervention, first aid is needed, and anyone can be trained to perform that function, get help, and save a life, including you today. This webinar will cover suicide prevention as well as suicide intervention. In a couple of weeks, we'll be having a follow-up webinar on postvention, which is how to manage those left behind when someone has completed suicide. Now, you'll notice that as I go through this seminar, I'm not saying committed suicide because that has a negative connotation. So in the world of dealing with suicide intervention and prevention, we tend to say that people have died by suicide or they have completed suicide. And that also is a verse to uh, attempted suicide. So there's attempted suicide and completed suicide. So let's talk about prevention versus intervention. Prevention is recognizing early signs and taking the steps to resolve those before someone begins contemplating suicide or before they start thinking about it more seriously. This also could be very early training, like with children, on developing coping tools and skills for managing stress, managing difficult emotions, and learning to problem solve and find resources when they do encounter difficult situations. Intervention is when someone has actually indicated in some way that they are thinking of suicide and you're stepping in to keep them safe and find ways for them to locate resources, resolve the problems and the feelings that have led them to thinking of suicide and to make sure the individual does continue forward with living. So take a minute and just imagine an 11 year old boy or a child about that age that you may know. This is a nice kid, funny, cute, has a pretty good home life, plays soccer on the weekends, maybe likes to play Xbox with his friends or his big brother. As far as you can tell, this is a pretty happy kid with a regular kid's life. But one day you get a call from this child's fifth grade teacher, and she says she needs to talk to you. While the class was working on a math assignment, and she was walking through the classroom like she always does, she glanced at this boy's desk and saw his paper. He was shaking a little bit and he was holding his pencil and she picked up what she was writing to take a closer look. This is what it said. This is for my mom, my dad, and he wrote his brother's name. This is my last word. I hope you are not grieving of my death. I'm sorry for my pain that I have put upon you. Mom, I love you. I am sorry. Would you know what to do for this child? Now, we don't always get suicide notes or such obvious signs and warnings that someone is contemplating suicide. And I'll talk more about this in the post pension webinar, but the percentage of suicides where a note is left behind is actually quite low at only about 25 to 30%. This is frustrating for several reasons. One, because we don't get the obvious warning or the chance to help the person. And two, because it leaves a lot of unanswered questions for those who are left behind. Like I said, we'll go over that in the postvention webinar. Whenever you hear about someone having taken their own life, the question most people ask first is, why? And then they assess the person's life, and usually you hear some comments like, but he was so young, or he was old, or he had a great life, a good home, a good marriage. The truth is, though, anyone can be at risk of suicide. It does not matter how old you are, what gender you are, what your socioeconomic status is, what race you are. Anyone is at risk. However, there are some statistics, and these are from 2012. Suicide statistics aren't updated very quickly. These may have changed a little bit, but are generally still very helpful for providing the big picture view of how we are affected by suicide statistically. So I'm going to read through these. There were 36,364 suicides in 2010, and this is in the U.S. 40,600 suicides in 2012, which equates to 111.23 suicides per day, which is one suicide every 12.9 minutes. 12.5 deaths per 100,000 were suicide. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. 
men had a suicide rate of 20.3, while women had a rate of 5.4. However, even though men had the higher suicide completion rate, females attempt suicide three times more often than males. Of completions of, of the number that was given here, 78.3% were male and 21.7% were female. Suicide rates are highest among those middle-aged, 45 to 59. Um, people tend to believe that teenagers, particularly teenage boys, have the highest suicide rate, in which case they actually do not. The second highest rate occurred in those over 75 years old, and I'm actually going to explain that a little bit more here in a minute. Ages 15 through 24 had a suicide rate of 10.9%, which is lower than middle-aged and older adults. Suicide ranks third as the cause of death among youth behind accidents and homicides. White males accounted for 65% of all suicides in 2012. Suicide rates have decreased in times of war and increased in times of economic crises. And I bet everyone would agree that money, money stress is one of the larger stresses in their lives. Suicide rates are the highest among the divorced, separated, and widowed, and lowest among the married. I'll explain that just briefly. That has to do with having a network of support system rather than being isolated and alone and having someone who can help you seek resources rather than not having someone. But my main point of all the statistics is at the bottom, and that is anyone is at risk. And I'll probably repeat that several times throughout this. The theory is that youth attempt suicide but are still ambivalent about dying, whereas the elderly are more intent on completion. And so their completion versus attempt rate is much higher. A lot of times with teenagers, they attempt suicide or appear to attempt suicide in order to gain attention. Um, this is them basically sending out a red flag. And I've had moms of teenage girls say to me, well, I think she's just trying to get attention. She is, and you should give that to her. And even if you have to do it multiple times, if someone is talking about suicide, their risk is higher that they may, they may attempt suicide. So the methods that people use, the most common method of suicide completion is firearms at a little over half. Males use firearms more than females. And the most common method of suicide for females is poisoning, which is basically an overdose of medication. Second and third are suffocation or hanging and then poisoning after firearms. So attempts versus completions. It's a little bit hard to measure suicide attempts because sometimes it may seem like self-harm, it may seem like um, a one-car accident. We're, we're not sure. It's hard to measure an attempt, but statistically, um, those that we try to report as suicide attempts, the statistics are here, 494,169 people visited a hospital for injuries due to self-harm behavior in 2012. So based on that, approximately 12 people harmed themselves for every reported death by suicide. Many suicide attempts go unreported or untreated. The survey suggests that at least one million people in the US each year engage in intentionally inflicted self-harm. And that self-harm not necessarily um, with the intent to die. As with suicide deaths, rates of attempted suicide vary considerably among demographic groups. While males are four times more likely than females to die by suicide, Females attempt suicide three times as often as males. Again, this, men use more lethal methods, so they use firearms, whereas women leave almost an out at times by taking medication. The ratio of suicide attempts to suicide death in youth is estimated to be about 25 to 1, compared to 4 to 1 in the elderly. And again, I'll talk more about the elderly in a bit. So there's a question of why and not the method necessarily. So we're going to talk about cause. The most frequent cause of suicide is mental illness, and the most frequent mental illness is depression. Among people who are depressed, intense emotional states, such as desperation, hopelessness, anxiety, or rage, increase the risk of suicide. This does not have to be a severe mental disorder. You'll hear mental illness. It's not necessarily a severe mental disorder, or even a visible or publicly known mental illness. Depression increases your negative emotional state. And being in a negative emotional state can increase your risk for suicide. 
this is a very basic slide with just two points on it, but these are your most important points for this whole webinar. People who consider suicide are either suffering from some kind of pain or some kind of loss or both. And almost every reason you have for suicide, you can track back to one of these basic reasons. As an example, compare the elderly. The pain and the loss that the elderly experience versus youth, whose problems of, of pain and loss are typically temporary. Due to age alone, the elderly experience a lot of loss. They lose their spouse, their partners. They lose their friends as they're all growing older. Uh, their grown children may be living farther away from home as well as their grandchildren. They experience the loss of their freedom and their independence when they move from what's probably their longtime family home into a senior living center or a nursing facility. They lose the loss of their ability or even permission to drive and to come and go as they please. They are experiencing ongoing continual loss. And they know it's not a situation that's going to get better, but will in fact only continue to increase their amount of loss as time goes by. Additionally, the elderly begin to experience the increase of pain, chronic pain, illness, just the loss of flexibility and mobility are all things that the elderly experience that they will not get better, but will only become worse as time passes. The elderly then are experiencing significant pain and significant loss, and they know that their situation will only get worse rather than better. Compared to teenagers, on the other hand, if they can realize that their situation is temporary, they have hope that the elderly do not have for their situation to improve. In intervention, there are three phases in a suicide intervention. So if someone comes to you, and, and, and we'll go over the how to recognize the signs that someone is thinking about suicide. If you have recognized one of those signs, you're going to go in the, into these three phases. And I'll go into these in detail one by one. This is the overview. Your first phase is connecting. This is building rapport gaining trust, allowing the person to say that they are thinking of suicide. The second phase is understanding. And this is your listening phase, where you patiently listen to them purge all of their worries and concerns and reasons for being unhappy. Between phases one and two, there's a slight gap. This is where you're listening for signs of them wanting to die. The third phase is assisting. This is the phase where you help the individual find resources. The gap between phase two and three is where you're listening for signs of them wanting to live. The gap between one and two and, the, and between two and three is the ambivalence. You're listening for their ambivalence. So you might say something like, I hear you say you want to die because nothing's going right, and that's between one and two. But I also hear you say that you're not that far from graduating and you have plans after that. So that's your phase between two and three. This gives them acknowledgement of what's going wrong with them and their feelings, but it also pulls out their positives to feed that ambivalence toward the life side. So let's go into these in detail. Phase one is connecting. This is where you take their cues, their signs, whatever you're seeing that is indicating that they may be contemplating suicide, and you ask them directly. This is a very hard thing for most of us to do because we want to hint around we want them to kind of say it without us having to ask directly. But they are going to appreciate you asking directly, and they may be waiting for you to ask directly because they're giving hints. And if you give hints back, then you're both just hinting. Your job as an interventionist in this, in this situation is to ask directly. Don't say things like, are you thinking of doing something crazy? Are you thinking of hurting yourself? Both of those could cover a multitude of things. Ask directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about taking your life? Are you thinking about dying? Use the word, are you thinking about suicide? It's very difficult, and it actually takes some practice. During the two-day assist class, it's a role-playing exercise where you practice actually asking that question, and it's very uncomfortable for people. So you, have to, you have to practice actually being direct. Those who are thinking about suicide have been carrying around those thoughts with them as a burden. It's weighing them down. And they're often relieved for someone to bring it up to them and acknowledge it and be there for them to share their thoughts with. This is not where you say, don't think about that. Stop thinking that way. Because then you're not connecting and you're not building that rapport. And this has to be your first step. You're actually shutting them down from being receptive to your help if you don't just 
acknowledge that they are thinking about suicide? If they answer yes to the question of are you thinking about suicide, all you have to say is, let's talk about this. And then you ask them for their reason. And this becomes you moving into phase two. So listen for signs in, in phase one called invitations. This is they're inviting you to actually ask that direct question. If they say things like, I just want to die, or I can't take it anymore, or I just want out, ask directly if they're having thoughts of suicide. Don't use those generalities. This gives the person permission to feel what they're feeling. Suicide is a dark subject, and it's, it's got finality to it, and it's got a stigma to it. And so people are a lot of times very reluctant to admit that they're thinking about suicide. That's not going to stop them from thinking about it. So you asking directly gives them the permission to think about it. Now, one thing you may have a fear of is if they're not thinking about suicide and they're just having a bad day or they're going through some problems and you ask them about suicide, will that plant the idea in their mind? It will not. If you weren't thinking about suicide today and someone asked you about it, you would say, no, I'm not thinking about it. That would not cause you to start thinking of that as your option just because they mentioned it. But if they are thinking about it, it's very important that you ask that question to them. They can then talk very openly, which is the best way for you to be able to later provide them help. They're going to feel some relief that you recognize it and actually ask about that. Okay, let's look for warning signs. And there's different, there's actions and thoughts. So let's start with actions. If you see someone giving away possessions, if you see, especially things that have meant a lot to them, if you see them withdrawing more than usual from their family and friends, from school, from their jobs, if they have a loss of interest in their hobbies and things that they previously were interested in and things that they enjoy, they no longer find enjoyment in those things, if they suddenly start a pattern of abuse of alcohol and drugs, if they have reckless behavior, this is sort of an apathetic, I just don't care what happens kind of thing. And you're looking for extreme behavior changes. Now, one thing that people talk to me a lot about is with teenagers, how am I going to know about a behavior change? Because in teenagers, their behavior changes every day. But you're looking for a pattern, an overall, not a mood, not they're in a bad mood. Oh, my gosh, they went to their room in a bad mood. I think they might be thinking about suicide. Because that would be almost a daily thing with, with a lot of teenagers. You have to watch for extreme patterns of behavior changes. Impulsivity. So if you see someone who's not typically impulsive suddenly being impulsive, it may come with an attitude of, I don't care what happens, and that's what you're looking for. And then self-mutilation, such as cutting. You're going to look for signs like that. Keep in mind that you're only looking for changes in someone's behavior. So if these are all normal behaviors, then it's not going to be as much of an alert. If someone is a normally lighthearted, happy person, and they suddenly become withdrawn and sullen, that's a behavior change you want to look at. If they are typically a cautious person, and suddenly they become reckless, that's the kind of behavior change you're looking for. Uh, warning signs as far as their thoughts. One misunderstanding that sometimes comes up with suicide is that people who are left behind think they, the person who died was being selfish by taking their own life. These comments in the warning signs that I, I'm going to read here in a second actually indicate that they feel like they will be doing their friends and family a favor by relieving them of a burden that the individual feels like they are causing to other people. It's not a selfish act. So listen for signs that indicate that the person feels like a burden to his or her loved ones. If they say things like, I won't be needing my things anymore, or things that are self-defeating, I can't do anything right, I can't take it anymore, I wish I were dead, a pretty obvious one, everyone will be better off without me. That's the burden relieving one right there. All of my problems will end soon, and no one can do anything to help me now. If you hear comments such as this, these are warning signs. They're red flags. Feelings. These are some, some feelings they may be going through. They may feel desperate. This means they feel like they have no options. They may feel angry. Anger almost all the time comes from some sort of foundation of hurt. If someone is angry about something, they are typically hurting from something. Guilty. If someone has guilt, it can be very overwhelming as an emotion to deal with. They may be feeling worthless. It means they feel like they have no value. Again, they may feel like a burden to the people around them. If they're sad, this is part of depression, and it may come from loss. 
if they feel hopeless. Again, this is without options or resources or the hope of things getting better for them and helpless. They may feel like they have no support, no options, no resources. They may feel like they have no solutions for whatever their problem is that they're dealing with. Okay, triggers. These are things that start the, the thinking that may lead to suicide thoughts. Triggers for someone to start thinking about suicide. And think about how these relate back to maybe either loss or pain. Getting into trouble with authorities. They may lose some freedom with that. Breaking up with a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a spouse. That's a loss. The death of a loved one or significant person. A loss. Knowing someone who died by suicide. And I have questions on this one. Like, Why does knowing someone increase your risk of suicide or, or maybe a trigger? Because, one, it's a loss for whoever has, has lost the person that they knew who died of suicide. It also then becomes familiar. So you'll hear copycat things in, in high school. Someone committed suicide, and then another child in the high school then a week later died by suicide. So it, it becomes, well, is it, is it kind of a trend, or why, what causes that? It's because it becomes familiar. Before someone in the school may have uh, taken their life, it was, un, it was unfamiliar to any of the other students. But once someone does it, it, it has a sense of familiarity to it, and almost a peer pressure in a negative way becomes an OK thing. And that's why you sometimes have two or three of them follow. Then there's also empathy and understanding. Someone dies by suicide, and, and if you're going through a hard time yourself, you may empathize with the person who took their life. And then you have your own, your, that becomes your own trigger. Um, others are bullying or being victimized. I dealt with a, a child yesterday who was being bullied and thinking of suicide. That can make you feel very isolated and very alone and um, play on all of your own negative thoughts and enhance those in your mind. Family conflict or dysfunction, because conflict is an isolating uh, factor. Academic crisis or school failure, that takes away hope. That's a loss of hope right there. Disappointment or rejection. Again, take, think about how all of these trace back to some sort of loss or some sort of pain. And it could be mental pain. It could be physical pain, emotional pain. Uh, abuse. Again, trauma exposure. So having been ex exposed to a trauma, whether you're a witness to some sort of trauma or you're part of a trauma. Serious illness or injury. That plays back to those feelings of hopelessness. Anniversary of the death of a loved one. That, that basically is a repeat of the initial loss. Forced or extended separation from friends or family. Again, is a loss. So now we're on to step two. Once you have recognized all the signs and you have sat down with the person and said, are you thinking of taking your life? And they say, if they say no, try asking a different way. And if you're sure that their no really means no, you don't need to move into step two. They're not thinking of taking their life. There's no need to intervene. If they have said yes, you're going to move into phase two, which is understanding. This is the part where you're going to listen thoroughly to all of the reasons the person feels like they want to die. And this is really, really hard. Without saying things like, OK, don't feel that way, or but think of all the good things in your life, you're going to go out of your comfort zone and let them tell you all of the reasons and justifications they have for ending their life. This goes against our human nature. If someone tries to push you off a cliff, it is your human nature to stop yourself from falling off the cliff. It is our human nature to save our lives rather than end our lives. So if someone is contemplating suicide is going against our very nature, and you as an interventionist in this situation, it's going against your nature to listen to someone talk about their reasons for wanting him to die. It's very difficult. Let them purge all of their reasons. Keep asking things like, what else? What more? Is there more? You don't even have to have anything else to say other than just asking questions and asking them to give you more. This is a very difficult phase, but this is the most crucial. And you can always go back. I've put the arrow across the, across the three phases because you can move back and forth between the phases. If you are in phase two and they're saying, well, I want to die because of blank, and you say, well, that's not that bad, you may have to move back into one 
and rebuild the rapport and reconnect with them because you may have disconnected with them at that very moment. It's okay. Move back into phase one, reconnect, tell them it's okay, let's talk about this. I understand you're feeling this way. I, you know, I may not see it the same way, but let's keep going. I want to hear everything that's going on with you. And you keep asking them to tell you what's going on with them. This could take a long time, depending on what the issues are. And it requires a lot of patience. But it's kind of like a well that, uh, that's about to burst. Unless you let that out little by little and little by little until the water has drained entirely, you still have that pressure buildup. So you've got to let it out as long as it takes. Let them just purge what it is that's going on with them. And things may seem insignificant to you that they're saying to you, but they're significant to them. And I use a demonstration when I go and speak to um, like high school groups and junior high groups in a classroom and have a student stand at the front. And if you can picture a student standing at the front with their arms held out like they're about to hold a heavy box or something, kind of like forklift style, and have each of the kids in the, in the class get their textbooks and bring them up one by one. And I ask them, name some stressors that may be part of this person's life, part of anyone's life. We don't see everyone's stressors as we're walking through the halls. Um, as we're you know, dealing with people in day-to-day -day life, we don't see their stressors, but they're carrying them around. And we can carry around one stressor for quite a while, but the more stressors you have and the longer you have to carry them, the harder it becomes. So I have the students come up and they may t bring a textbook, one textbook, and they lay it on the, the student's arms and they say, oh, how about homework? Okay, great. So this person's standing there holding a textbook and, and that stressor is homework. And they could probably carry that around for a while. Not a big deal. And then another student comes up and they say, um, the parents are divorcing. So they put the textbook up on top of the second textbook. And now the student's holding two textbooks. OK, he's got you know, homework and his parents are divorcing. And then another person comes up and they say, may say financial problems. So he's got three textbooks. And you can picture them as they keep coming up and they keep naming stressors. You can handle one stressor for a long period of time. But imagine a student standing there with 10 textbooks on his arms. And they're getting heavy. And as stressors do, he, they're weighing him down. And his arms start to shake. And I typically stand there and just talk to the students about stressors and so forth and, and how they, they weigh on us while the students' arms are getting weaker and weaker. And I, and I say, when we started this, you could look out into the classroom and you could talk to all the students. And they're kind of laughing because he's volunteered or whatever. And, and he's fine. But now I ask, where is the focus? And he says, my arms. His arms are getting weak. Um, and his arms are getting tired. And really what he's focusing on now is his arms and the pain. The more you put on there, or the longer he has to hold those. So if he had to walk through his entire day holding those 10 textbooks on his arms, what would he be focusing on? It's going to be the pain in his arms. And let's say he had to come back the next day and he's still holding them. He's not going to care who else is sitting in the classroom. He's not going to care what we're saying to him. He's not going to be seeing any other options. What he's really going to be saying is, these books are really heavy and my arms are really tired. And after you do that for a long enough time, what is, if you can picture him standing there, the one thing he really wants to do with those textbooks is just drop them so that his arms will stop hurting. That is suicide. That is where people get to when they're holding a whole lot of stressors and they're having to carry them around for a longer period of time. All they see is, I just want this to stop. I don't care that I'm going to drop all these books all over the floor, that it's going to make a mess, Anything else, all they care about right now is making my arms stop hurting. That's where people get to. So that might help you understand this phase and how it helps. So I have the students come up and take those textbooks off one by one and say, I can help you with your homework. OK, I can talk to you about your parents. I can help you with you know, finding a job. Whatever will solve those things and provide them resources, other people take them off one by one. And that's what we're going to look to doing in phase three. So it's still part of phase two, understanding. Listen to those reasons for dying. Then you're also going to hear, listen to things they're saying, but not necessarily point them out yet. So they may say, you know, my family stresses me out. The only one I like is my little sister. OK, you make note of that. That's something you're going to use as a positive in a bit. When you're going through listening to the reasons for dying, the person feels like they're being listened to, which really is half the problem. And they're more likely to move towards getting help. Once you review the risk with the person, which is basically saying, you have a whole lot of stressors, 
and I can see why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Let's see what we can do to get you some help. Once they've been able to tell you all of those things without you being judgmental, without you saying don't feel that way, once they've been able to share all that with you and hand those books to you one by one, they feel respected, they feel more likely that you're listening to them and that you're there for them and that you're in it with them. And then they're going to listen to you help develop their safe plan. So here's how you go through a risk review. You're trying to see someone has made comments and you don't know if they are at risk or if they're just making comments or if maybe they've talked about killing themselves for years and they joke about it and you know play the whole gun to the head thing all the time and, and suddenly you think maybe it's changed. This is how you see there are six red flags. We use red flags for a reason. So you go through these one by one and you may sit down and ask them these questions exactly like they're worded here to go through and check, check, check. Check them off and see how many risk factors they have. So the first one is, are you having thoughts of suicide? If they say yes, your goal, your job is over on the right, suicide. You're going to keep them safe. You're going to find them a safety contact, which is who will you call when you're actually by yourself and you're thinking about suicide? You're going to ask them to cease or decrease the use of alcohol and drugs. Alcohol is a depressant. It's going to make things worse. Now, if they are a heavy drinker, you might not want to tell them to just stop drinking all of a sudden. That may actually be an added stressor for them. So you're going to ask them to just decrease their use. And then you're going to link them to resources to get them help. That's your first red flag if they say yes. Current factors. So if they say yes, you need to ask them, do you know how you plan on killing yourself? If they say no, I haven't thought about that, that's good. They haven't gone that far into their suicide plan. So you're trying to figure out how prepared are they. If you say, do you know how, and they say yes, and they, they may say, I'm going to take um, pills, you're going to say, do you have the pills? Yes, I have them in my purse. Do you know, the next question is, when are you going to do it? How soon? When were you planning on doing this? And if this is a, a teenager, again, I use, who says, well, I'm going to wait. My parents are going out of town this weekend. I thought I would take them while they were gone. They are high risk because they have the plan, they have the means, and they have the timing already figured out. You need to disable their suicide plan. This means if it was a gun they were planning on using, take the gun out of their uh, vicinity where they can't access it. Take the pills that they were planning on using. However their method was, you need to take that away. If you think they're in imminent danger, that you think they may do this before the day is over, you can't leave their side. The next one is pain. Do you have pain that at times, pain that at times feels unbearable? Now, generally, people that are high risk for suicide are going to answer yes to this question. Your responsibility in this then is to ease the pain somehow. So it, it may just be letting them talk to you. That may be easing their pain. It's at least the first step. The resources done. Do you feel you have few, if any, resources? Go back to where I said, um, people that are si single, widowed, divorced have a higher rate of suicide than those that are married. That's simply because of the fact that they have resources versus not having resources. The states in the U.S. that have the higher suicide rates are the more um, states like Montana, where people live very remotely and have not the immediate access to hospitals that people in high-density cities have. So you have to make sure they have resources. Then you're going to go into their background. Have you ever attempted suicide before? If someone has prior suicidal attempts, they are at a higher risk. That adds a red flag to them. Back to the familiarity. It's no longer an unknown. They've already tried it in the past. They have a feeling of how it feels to have tried before. So that makes it easier. So you need to protect against that danger. Then mental health. Are you receiving or have you received mental health care? You're going to link to Yes, I'm seeing a counselor. You're going to have them call their counselor. So assess these six red flags. If they have one, they're at risk. But they have more than one, they're at higher risk. And if they have all six, you should take them to the emergency room. All right, listening skills. I teach a whole class on listening skills just based off of the assist suicide intervention training because this happens to be the most important part of that phase too. Listen without judgment or opinions. This is the part we have a hard time not saying, yeah, but think about this. That's not part of it. Listen without judgment or opinion. 
Listen to negative without interjecting the positive. Let the speaker purge. Use acknowledgement phrases and repeat back. All that is is you saying, I understand that that feels stressful to you. Oh, you're very worried about that. You're just repeating back their feelings. Don't say things like, I know how you feel or I understand because they are most likely, no matter what's going on with them, not going to think that anyone knows how they feel. People with suicidal ideation think they are the only ones that feel this way. They feel very isolated. Instead, just acknowledge the person's feelings with comments like, I can see you're really struggling, or I hear how hopeless you're feeling. And just listen patiently. For a lot of us, that's the hardest part of this whole thing. Phase three is assisting. This is where you're going to address the things they brought up in phase two, all of the things they purged to you, and you're going to help them to find resources. You're going to contract a safe plan. So that's asking them to commit or promise to not harming themselves until you can get the resources in place and the individual can give them a chance to turn things around. Sometimes people make this a written contract so that it, they buy in more. I am signing this and I promise I am not going to harm myself until we have talked to the counselor. You're going to use their ambivalence between their reasons for dying and their reasons for living, and you're going to start to try to pull them more toward the reason for living. So that's bringing out those things like, well, okay, I heard you say that your sister, your little sister is kind of close to you. And they can say, yeah, and you, tell, you get them to talk about that positive thing. And you don't say, so don't you want to live for her? You just have them talk about her. Talk about why, what they like, how they're close, and you have them start thinking about those positives. This does not have to be a strong, confident footing in the for living side. It only needs to get them out of the 100% want to die side. Enough so that more weight is put on the living side than the dying. Ambivalence, which is really just being unsure as to whether they want to live or die at the time, is good because it means they are not determined anymore just to die. They are now thinking about other options. Ask the person to give you the means if they have it available to them, the gun, the, the medicine, whatever they were going to do, ask them to give it to you. If they've determined a time frame, ask them to wait. Find the resources with the individual and have them commit to contacting them. You may even have to pick up the phone right there with them and make the phone call for them. A lot of times depression is part of this, uh, this whole process and they don't even have the energy to make the phone calls and, and pick up on those resources and follow through like they need to. So you may have to do it for them. You may go with them and I would call right then to arrange their resources. Don't say, next week sometime maybe call the counselor. You need to do it right then. Um, contracting a safe plan helps the person feel encouraged. It gives them hope. And by giving them hope, they are more likely to commit to the safe plan that you've arranged. Follow up on that commitment. So they have to follow up and you can follow up. The person's safety need is met. You've taken what you need to take. They feel supported. And because of this, they're more likely to stay or keep safe. Here are some resources. And there are a lot more. And you can think of your own. So there's the, the 1-800 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline phone number. You can always call 911. You can always take someone to the emergency room. However, people are more likely not to take themselves to the emergency room. This is probably something that you're going to end up taking someone to the emergency room. Once in the emergency room, a, a physician will assess them, and they'll probably call in a case manager or a counselor that they have either in the hospital or, or on contract who will come talk to the person and assess their risk level. If they think they are in imminent danger and they're very high risk, they may admit them to their psych unit or send them to a direct admit somewhere else into a psychiatric unit. If they're not that high and they think they may need just some help over the next period of time, they'll send them to a crisis center for help. And they can get resources there. You can also call their physician. You can call family members and friends. You can call their clergy. Get them to call their counselor. One thing we have a lot in the high schools that I go and speak to is kids don't want to talk to tattle on other kids. So kids will frequently say, Things like, I have been thinking about killing myself, but do not tell my parents. Don't tell anyone. Well, if your best friend in high school is telling you a secret and telling you not to tell someone, it puts a whole lot of pressure on a kid not to tell. But it's a big mistake not to. Because by saying this to them, they're asking for help. 
anytime anyone says they're thinking about killing themselves, they're throwing out a flag and asking for help. And they're basically saying, my situation is or feels so bad that I don't know what to do about it. And the only way I can communicate that is to tell you that I'm thinking about killing myself and I really need help. So I think a high school kid who was doing this would almost be disappointed if their friend did not tell someone because then their friend did not seek help for them. And another thing I have to tell them is I would rather have my best friend mad at me and maybe never speak to me again for having shared their secrets than to wake up the next morning and have found out that my friend killed herself overnight. So it may seem like a bad thing at the time to go tell someone or to call, make a phone call on behalf of someone, but it may save their life. So in summary, one thing you do is look for signs. Once you recognize those signs, you directly ask about suicide. And then you take as much time as you need to to listen to the person talk about why they are considering dying. Typically, they don't want to die. They just want that pain to stop. Remember the books on the arm example. Then you sit with them and you make a safe plan. You figure out how to keep them safe to keep them alive. And then you put their resources in place. And there's the 1-800 number for the National Suicide Talk Line. And it's a 24-7 number. It does not matter how old you are. So I've given this phone number to children, to adults. It doesn't matter how old you are. It's anonymous. They may ask for your first name. But you can give this number to anyone. And it's a national hotline number. And you can call and talk to them at any time, as long as you want to, about absolutely anything. And they are trained basically to listen and then to look up resources that may help you. That is all the information I have for you today. Um, I think we have some questions and answers ready to go, questions waiting for me to answer. So I'm going to, at this point, turn it back over to Erin Heather. Amy, um, this is Heather. I just want to say that this has been an excellent presentation. Um, we received some feedback from folks participating, uh, one being a crisis negotiator, and they found this session to be extremely informative um, and likewise. Great. Great. Um, very informative session. And we do have some time for a few questions. And a couple have come in, and I'm just going to go ahead and address those at this point. Okay. Um, the first question we received is, how does this apply to those individuals, specifically in the justice system, both juvenile or and or adult facilities? OK. This is the Justice Clearinghouse. Great question. And what, what I want to say about that is the same thing I said about everyone is at risk. It doesn't matter who you are. So this could apply to those in the justice system, in, in the jail system, in the prison system, in rehab facilities equally. You just have to go back and, and assess things like what have they lost, what pain are they struggling with, so if someone has um, acted out and, and let's say they have an anger issue, which has caused them to do things they may not have done otherwise, remember that anger comes from hurt. So you're going you're gonna to use the exact same method no matter where the person is, whether it's a kid in junior high who's on the playground being bullied or it's a juvenile or an adult um, in the justice system who's going through the justice system and all the issues that go with that. You're going to use the exact same process, and they are the exact same on the inside. However, remember that also mental illness ha plays a part in this. A lot of people in the just justice system um, are there because they have mental illness and maybe aren't on their medication to stop their um, the behavior that got them there. Now, not all. Everybody makes, you know, some people who make bad choices, they're there for whatever reasons they're there. This process, though, is going to apply across the board to everyone. You're still going to look for the same signs. You're still going to ask them the exact same way. And you're still going to listen to them as thoroughly as possible and as patiently as possible in the exact same way. You're going to implement a safe plan. And you're going to find whatever resources are available within the system to them. So same, same exact process. It does not matter you know, where, where they are or who they are. So, our audience today, we have um, a folks from very diverse 
uh, backgrounds and disciplines, um, a lot of folks in the law enforcement community. Um, we received a question uh, during the session uh, around 911 dispatchers. And that is, um, so it, I'll just read it to you. Suggestions, sure. what suggestions do you have for 911 dispatchers who don't have a lot of time between answering the call and arrival of officers on scene, often without knowledge of them even being dispatched in the first place. Um, so more specifically, how, how can dispatchers um, help <laughs> get the caller to put down perhaps the gun and open right. the door to talk to officers who arrive on scene? Right. So you're typing in your officer needs to go to such and such an address, and you know you have four minutes before they get there, and you're trying to save a life in that four-minute four, four minute time. Remember the CPR thing. You're there for first aid, and so you're, you're basically going to maybe skip straight to, you're going to build a rapport. First of all, remembering the fact that you don't need to talk them into um, trusting you with their problems. They called you. So that's the first step. They've built that rapport immediately. They called, which means they are ambivalent, which means they didn't just pick up the gun and shoot themselves. They actually stopped and made a call, and they've thrown out that flag and said, I want help. Somebody help me. So you've already got that built. You're going to skip straight to making a safe plan. So let's say they call and say, I have a gun to my head, and I need you to give me a reason not to use it. In the meantime, you're dispatching someone to their house to go help them, you're going to, at, this, at that time, you have that very short period of time to say, promise me, let's make a promise. I've got help on the way. Let's promise that you're going to stay safe until help gets there. After that, you can talk to them. We'll find you resources. We'll do whatever we can. But until then, for five minutes or ten minutes or however long you think it will take somebody to get there, promise me you won't do anything until they get there. And then ask them to buy into that. And then once they do then, use the remaining time you have to say, so tell me what's going on and just ask them, what is the worst thing, if you had to name the worst thing that's going on with you right now that ca that's causing you to make this phone call or to have these thoughts today, what would that be? And they may say, you know, my wife just left me or whatever it is. You start that conversation and you have that conversation until help arrives. The very first thing you do though is you're going to kind of skip those first steps knowing that they reached out to you and you're not having to draw them in to admit this to you. They've called and they've already made that admission. So you're on the next step, and you're on to, on to just keeping them safe first. Does that answer that? Yeah, actually, the, the, the question, the individual who had the question wrote, good advice. Thank you so much. OK, great. Perfect. Um, the next question we have is around um, probation officers and probation officials. Um, the first one being, um, how can they help their clients in the probation environment? OK, awesome. Same process, and I keep kind of being repetitive, but it really is so important to listen to people. Try to name someone in your life or someone you've experienced anything with who actually doesn't want to be listened to when something's going on. That's typically not the case. So even in a probation thing, they may, you know, they play tough, they do whatever, they have had all sorts of experiences in their background that some of us can't even try to understand. Um, they may have mental illness. They, whatever they have gone through, whatever their experiences are, they still want to be listened to. So you're going to want, you know, provide the resources. They're going to be the same resources as other people need. They may need counseling. They may need um, a support group. They may whatever their situation is. And I can't go into specifics, obviously, because there's a billion different um, variables there. But they want to be listened to. It would be my first advice. And Sometimes you don't have that time. You know, as a probation officer, how many people are you dealing with? And you can't sit down and spend hours upon hours just listening to them. But if you listen to someone thoroughly one time, you may save having to listen to them halfway ten times. So sometimes it just takes making that commitment to sit down and actually listen really well and listen really thoroughly to someone. And if they feel like you've listened to them, that may help them halfway to they don't feel alone. So let's say, for example, and I'm just going to throw this out as a weird story, but if you, if you have something happen at work and you want to go home and tell somebody about it, your spouse or your kids or whoever you tell, you go home and you tell the story and they halfway listen and they go, that's neat, okay, well, that's too bad, and they go on, when's dinner ready, and you keep going your conversation, you still feel like you need to tell somebody, and so maybe you'll call 
you know, a, a family member elsewhere or a friend. And if they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm in a hurry. What happened? Okay, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then they don't listen. You still feel like you need to tell somebody. But if someone will sit down and really listen and eye to eyes just sit and listen to you and ask you more questions about that incident or experience or how you feel or what you're going through until you feel purged, you're good. You don't need to tell anymore. You don't feel the anger anymore a lot of the times. A lot of counselors really just listen, and that's what people need is just to be listened to. And a lot of people, either in the justice system or in the, in the probation system, they don't have anybody who just genuinely listens to them. Amy, those were some excellent points. Um, we do have some time for just a couple more questions. I realize that we're getting a few more questions than we have time for. Um, so if for some reason we don't address your question today, please follow up with us, and we'll make sure um, that we get in touch with you and we address the questions that you have. Um, the next question we have is, do you have any specific advice for uh, folks in prevention? Um, and it goes on. It says, we are not treatment counselors, so do not want to overstep our areas of expertise. So how do we balance the conversations between awareness and referrals? Okay, good question. Because you don't want to jump the gun and, and you know assume everybody's in imminent danger if they're at the beginning of the process. So that kind of goes back to prevention rather than intervention. And prevention is a lot of things like learning the tools for anger management, learning uh, coping skills. Uh, if, if you're being bullied, learn, learning coping skills for being bullied and finding out how to communicate that to someone else or, or to seek help for your situation. Um, it's, and a lot of times it's, it's best done when, when, you know, it's kids or someone in their youth. But I think we all, as, as I'm almost 50 and I could easily learn some more uh, coping skills for things, you know, people at work or whatever it is you deal with on a daily basis. If you have coping skills, and the tools um, internally to deal with everything that life throws at you, you're going to be less likely to get to the point where you feel hopeless and where you feel uh, like giving up and like you feel you have nowhere to turn. And that's that's a lot of what suicidal thought is, is you don't, you don't see other options. So part of prevention is then creating ahead of time your default um, go-to. So if we don't have, if, if right now that um, people wherever you're sitting said, the building's on fire, we've had fire drills, I know exactly where I'd go, and that's my default. But if I didn't know, I would scramble around and try to figure out what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to do my default thing, which is probably just run and scream. So if something happens to us and we have not yet developed a default plan, we're going to go to whatever's natural to us, and that may not always be the best thing. So if you say, okay, if somebody's bullying me before it happens, this is how I'm going to handle it. Step A, step B, step C. And you may have to use some variation of that because obviously not every situation is the same. Or if such and such happens, kids worry about the, their parents divorcing. So you may talk to them and say, your parents fight a lot, you're worried about them divorcing. Let's talk about what if they did. Then how are you going to handle it? Then when the time comes and the, the traumatic event or whatever it is that's going to cause this problem comes about, they've got a pre-thought-out plan as to how they'll handle it, rather than the default, which may not be the best uh, plan for them to take. So that's just preparation for handling things that life throws at us. Again, incredibly, <laughs> yeah, excellent points, excellent advice again. Um, we're going to take two more questions. Um, the next question has to do around agency policies and protocols. And okay. more specifically, it says, while probation officers may be trained, how important do you think it is that an agency have a policy and protocol in place? For specifically how to handle, I'm trying to clarify the, the pro protocol and policy for what specifically, and is it for um, someone who sees signs of suicidal ideation or... Yeah, you know, let's just go with that because it didn't go into more specifics. Okay. Protocol and policy, obviously we're all in our jobs supposed to follow protocol and policy, and they are put into place for a reason. A lot of it is liability, uh, legal reasons, that sort of thing. But a lot of it is also thought out, well thought out. And again, this is your default plan when you don't have a default plan. So it's, it's almost to keep people within parameters. So one of the parameters, I'll use this as an example for for 
may be helping with this and situation. I'm not sure where this person is going with their question, but as someone who gets involved in a suicide intervention, you tend to, because you're because you're building an empathy for this person, and because you spend so much time listening to this person, you actually spend a lot of time with the person. You actually tend to kind of become part of their situation. So one of the things that's really hard, and what I was taught when I started first answering the suicide talk line, and then when I started teaching other people, it was easier to teach than to do. But you take that phone call and you handle that situation, and when you hang up, you let go. And that's really hard. But I think that's one of the things that maybe policy and, and that sort of thing is in, in place for, is so that you're not, you know, I want to drive by the person's house and stop in and bring them a pie and make sure they're doing okay. And that's probably something that is product policy and protocol is outside of policy and protocol. And it's for your safety. And it's for the fact that you're supposed to be providing and finding resources for that individual and not being their resource ongoing. Because you could then become everyone's ongoing resource and you're going to become completely drained. And you're not going to be taking care of yourself. So you find all those resources in place that, that fit that person and then you let go. And that may be a policy and protocol thing, is to say this is your parameter, you work within this, you talk to the person, you get them help, and then you let go. So in that case, I think it would be essential. Um, if it says don't talk to them about this and don't talk to them about that and don't ask about their personal life, it's not going to be that helpful for that to be a policy. So I might suggest working on changing the policy so that you have time to sit and talk with the person and let them talk about anything. But without knowing the specifics of that, I'm not sure how else I can answer. Yeah, I think you did a good job explaining it, Amy. Um, again, excellent advice. Um, the final question we have, and you may have mentioned it a few times, um, but I just wanted to make sure that it was addressed. And that is, when law enforcement is dealing with sui a suicidal person suffering from mental health issues mm -hmm. and currently not taking their medications, does the same type of approach you described apply, or are there different methods that you suggest? The same approach is going to apply, but it depends on their on their on what their mental illness is. Um, because you can't sit and just logically have a conversation with someone if they have, I don't even name, 10 different severe mental disorders. Um, let's just use schizophrenia. If they have a schizophrenic disorder, you can't sit and just say, okay, well, tell me all your problems, and then 10 minutes later they feel better. That's not going to solve their problems. You're going you're gonna to probably have to go more, more quickly to resources and then have one of those resources be a suicide intervention resource as well. So again, you're going to skip maybe to the safe plan, depending on what the mental illness is. Um, if they're purposely noncompliant with their medications, that's going to be call their, call their counselor, call their physician, and try to get them to be compliant. Um, find resources where they can maybe get help affording their medication, if that's one of the reasons they're not taking it. You have to kind of get to the bottom of that. So your initial, your initial goal then is to keep them safe, keep them alive, and then get resources in place to help them with their mental illness and with the compliance for their medication for a long-term solution. Thank you again uh, for expanding on that. So this actually concludes the question and answer portion of the webinar. And before we disconnect, there are a few points that I want to kind of make sure that everybody's aware of. And the first one being that um, the session was recorded. It will be on the Justice Clearinghouse uh, website by early next week. Um, the other point I want to mention is that there is a second webinar planned um, where Amy will be the instructor on November 13th. And Amy, if you want to talk a little bit about that or share any closing remarks with folks attending today. Sure. The next webinar is on postvention. And that is, um, it's a weird word. People don't understand really what it is. because it's, But it's basically when you're not able to intervene and someone does die by suicide. So it's for first responders who show up on the scene and find someone who has taken their own life. It's for family members who have lost someone to suicide and have a lot of questions. Um, it's for anybody basically who is there and left after someone has died by suicide to kind of help answer a bunch of those questions and to manage that process because that, that begins a whole new process. You can't intervene or prevent anymore. 
but you can but you can pass that um, lesson on and prevent or intervene with people that are affected by it. Because like I said earlier, a risk factor or a trigger may be knowing someone who died from suicide. So then you have to go into prevention for the people that surrounded that event afterwards. Well, um, this actually concludes today's webinar. Amy, um, thank you so much um, You're so for welcome. your time and your expertise today, um, putting this presentation together and preparing for the next one. Um, we had over 200 individuals registered for today's webinar. Um, you did an outstanding job, so I want to thank, thank you, you so for much. That. I'm glad to do it. I'm always glad to pass on the information. So thank you for allowing me to. Great. Great, and thank you to everybody who attended today and the questions that we received. If for some reason we didn't get to your question, please follow up with us afterwards. We're more than happy to have an offline conversation with you. And um, this concludes our webinar. So stay safe, everybody. Have a happy Halloween, and um, enjoy your day. Bye-bye.